without knowing it. But Lord, we will be of the company of those that press in and take possession of that which you have for us in your glorious presence. Praise the Lord. And I just want to announce to you today very quickly, also, do not let anyone take you out of God's presence. This very moment, don't let anyone take you out. If they're calling your phone, put it on silent. If a thought comes to your mind of somebody that you need to reach out to, clear the buffers of your mind. Clear the buffers of your mind. Especially mothers. Sometimes mothers cannot stop thinking about their children. They can't stop thinking about what they have to do. So by hearing God's presence today, I want you to be a child of God yourself and just know that God has his focus on you. You cannot let anybody take you out today. Not by any urgency, not by any need or demand. Let your attention be absolute in the name of Jesus. We will go once again to Matthew chapter 7, today verse 14. Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. Praise the Lord. You know what? I just remembered um, that I was going to read Mark chapter 3. Um, and then once we just touch on Mark chapter 3 very quickly, then we're going to move on from there. Um, let's look at Mark chapter 3, verse 3. And what does it say? It says, and I'm reading from the New King James Bible, just in case you're wondering why mine may sound different to yours. And it says, and he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. I want to just encourage you today very quickly to recognize one thing that you are never without. You may not be with what you want, but you are never without what you need. For you to be without what you need is for you to agree with your situation that God is not good. You see, when I say God is good, I want us to think about God being good from a different perspective today. You know, you can say that Josephine is good because if she has two dollars and you ask for one, she'll give it to you. I hope. And typically, we attribute goodness to good works. Right? Even the Bible says concerning the Lord Jesus that he went about doing good, healing those who are oppressed of the devil. Because he was doing good. But I want us to think about God is good from the same perspective that Chris has when he says concerning the golf that we're planning that we're good. He would say, oh, pastor, we're good. Meaning everything is in place. So when God gives you his word, he's good because he is good for every word that he speaks. He guarantees his own word. The Bible talks about the two immutable things by which it is impossible for God to change or to disappoint. And that is himself, sore by himself. And so because when we say God is good, sometimes we think about God is good from the perspective of the good things that he does, but we don't extend that goodness to how faithful he is for that which he has said that you have not seen. Very quickly today, I want to, I, I can't wait to declare this because when it hit me, I, at first I thought it was funny and the Holy Spirit told me that it was serious. So I'm like, okay, it's serious. He said to me today to pray for those who have been trying to lose weight who have not been able to. And I'm going to be one of those people. I'm, I'm glad for the weight that I have lost, but I haven't gotten to where I was going. You understand what I mean? When I set out from 209, I was going to 190. Can we just say thank God for 196? But 196 is not quite 190, so I still have some weight to lose. I say that just to encourage you, just so that you know that you are not alone in this journey. 
And so I want to just say it as, as, as yeah, that was my reaction. You, you, you know, you all you're laughed. Is God interested in those things? Yes, God is. Because he knows how much he bothers you. He knows how much it, 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 sometimes when we try to do things like that and we're not making progress, we begin to doubt everything else. We begin to doubt, our, uh, doubt ourselves. We begin to doubt if prayer works. But I tell you what, God is here in his mercy. And I want you to know that no matter what that number is that you desire, your dietitian may tell you that it's unrealistic. Other people may tell you that they don't think you can ever get there. But today I want you to just lay hold of the grace that is available today in the house. God has brought you a gift. Why don't you just receive it and say, Father, if you're saying that I will do it, that you will make it possible, it will happen. I will receive it. I will be that new size. I will go shopping for new clothes because these old ones won't fit anymore because they'll be too baggy. I receive it in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. And, um, and I tell you what, for some of us, for some people, it is not just uh, a physical um, weight lifting. It's not like the weight is just getting lifted off of you physically. For so many people, it has spiritual consequences as well. You know, because certain things that our bodies retain are not from the foods that we eat. They are from the emotions that we harbor. You know, because um, we, we can't let some bloggers on, on, on the internet fool us. We know that our bodies are not just a function of what we put into it. Jesus says it is not what goes into a man that defiles him, but it is what comes out of him. And in some cases, it is what refuses to come out of him. You understand what I mean? Yes, because the Bible says in 3 John 2 that, and this was the Apostle John speaking, he says, brethren, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. So I know that the soundness of my body is a function of the soundness of my soul. But you know how the devil will make you focus on the material because he knows that he can, he can manage to continue to handle you. In the, in the physical or in the material if you are not engaging that warfare with your spiritual artillery. The Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and casting down imaginations and any high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. And so, my initial reaction was that I laughed, but then again, when the Holy Spirit said it's happening today, I'm like, man, I will not get in the way of what the Lord is doing in the life of his children, in the lives of his children. Praise the Lord. So we will take a couple of testimonies before we get back to Mark chapter three. God bless you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think this, this sounds just about right. I'm happy. If y'all can hear me good, can't you? Awesome possum. God is good. So we'll take a couple of testimonies real quick. I was going to take the testimonies at the end, uh, but then I've been led another way. You know, it's good to be led another way. At least you know that this is not you. This is the Lord. Alrighty. And so um, we thank God for Sister Z's testimonies even coming out of Saturday, how immediately the Lord has given her the ability to take hold of one of those axes with which to fell more trees. God bless you for that. Um, praise God. And so... How about if we started with um, Alan? I believe that our, our brother Alan has a testimony to share. Come on now, let's just let's celebrate him. Why don't you get your own microphone as you're coming? If you can get your own mic as you're coming, that'll be awesome. And I just want to say a couple of things about testimonies, you know. <clears throat> Praise God. We need to hear the testimonies of others. Look at the way the enemy uses other people's blessings against us. In the world, when people hear of something good happening to another person, rather than doing what the word of God says, which is to rejoice with those who rejoice, people be getting jealous. People be questioning whether you deserve that. You know, my wife was telling me in the plane, I mean, I said in the plane, on the plane, no, no, in the car, as we were coming, <laughs> oh yeah, praise God. My wife was telling me on the, in the car as we were coming, she said, I heard a pastor's wife, we, we, we've, we know of these pastors uh, from the Northeast, saying that several people stopped talking to them when their church started to grow 
because they came to the husband and said, what are you doing? Is it your media team? Are you using the internet? Are you advertising? And the man was like, I am brained. <laughs> and they got angry because they're like, aren't we brained too? People always want to challenge your worthiness. Some people just don't think that you deserve it because, I mean, what is he doing that I am not doing? Why should he be getting that? So when you look at what is going on in the carnal world or dimension, it gives you a clear picture of what we should expect in the body of Christ. And what we expect in the body of Christ is rather than trying to disqualify the one that has been blessed, and by so doing disqualifying ourselves, we recognize that that is the grace of God at work in their lives. And by so doing, you engage that grace of God to be at work in your life too. So as we take testimonies, I want you to connect your heart with what is being said as a work that is being done by the grace of God and then apply it to wherever you may need that grace. If somebody comes up here today to give a testimony of healing, which someone will, my sister uh, Kanida will come and give a testimony of healing, guess what's gonna happen? You may not need healing in the body, but you need healing in your mind. So what do you do? You're like, man, the same power that heals that body can renew this mind. You understand what I mean? The same power that gave them the breakthrough can give me what? The deliverance that I also need. Let us not just hear it as, oh, well, thank God for them. And they say we should rejoice. Hee, hee, hee. No, let us hear it as a weapon. Let us receive it as a tool, a functional tool. The Bible says, and they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of their testimony. When we testify, we testify of the goodness of the Lord. Alrighty. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Cornelia, you want to come up here and be ready, ready? Or are you going to be ready where you're at? Okay, she's ready where she's at. Alrighty. Alan and James, everybody. I mean, Alan and Diamond, everybody. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. So let me quickly tell you James. Yeah? So that you do not forget. The name James is the name Jacob. Right? But many people do not know. So many people that you see that are called James, their names are actually Jacob. And in the season that we're in, I jumped the gun a little bit, but once you hear the testimony and this one, it's all going to make sense. So you know where the James is coming from. In the season that we're in, many of us will rediscover the true meaning of our names as opposed to what people call us. So get ready for that. Praise the Lord. Allen and Diamond. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, I give glory and honor to God. We didn't know we were going to go first. God is good. You know, um, <clears throat> the, uh, come close, baby. Come close. So uh, <laughs> I need to feel her close to me. Um, you know, many of us have grown up hearing our elders say, you don't tell everybody your business. You see, and it wasn't until I got older that I saw how that hindered, or it can hinder your testimony. Because what the Lord grants unto you is for you to share. So, um, when I reached out to the man of God to say, hey, uh, it's, it's on me. I want us to share this testimony. Uh, one thing I did not remember, uh, Pastor, was um, a little while ago, this mighty woman of God, my dear sister, May Walita, had uh, put my wife and I to the side. And um, she said, I, the Lord gave me a vision that I saw y'all sitting at a table putting out before the Lord your plans, plans for your family and in ministry. And um, I said, okay. And during that time, even I would say almost forgetting what the woman of God had said, but I know my spirit man did, didn't. It was deep unto deep. The Lord began to lead my wife and I into a very strategic time of prayer. And this is what I want to encourage you all in don't sell yourself short. If you know that the Lord has been showing you something that is going to be a blessing to the body, you get visions, you daydream about, oh, how I could do this and that. 
Do not worry about who application you got to fill out. Come on, somebody. Don't worry about what these man-made requirements that have been placed in this realm to keep you bound. Don't, look, if you're gonna come before your daddy, the one that placed the desire within you, you go to him with that same energy, as some would say, to say, okay, Lord, I see it. I witness what you're doing, what you wanna do through me. Now I confess it. I put it back before you and I now enter to a place of thanksgiving and praise concerning that thing. And then you allow the Lord to deal with you. And so during this time of just prayer and seeking the Lord, there were very specific instructions that the Lord would give us. And just to let you guys know, we are not at liberty just yet to share the details, okay? But I, we share this to lift you in your faith, okay? And so as the Lord began to lead us, I want you to do this this way and that this way, okay? We would, or I say we would, we took a key from the disciples. You know, many a time when the Lord Jesus, and I'm gonna wrap this thing up, when the Lord Jesus would, <laughs> I feel my daddy, when the Lord Jesus would miss the mysteries, the disciples oftentimes would pull the Lord to the side after he ministered. Rabbi, what did you mean by this? And we took a cue by reaching out to the man and woman of God, our mommy and daddy, Pastor Rosemary, Pastor uh, uh, Moses, concerning what the Lord had been revealing to us and how to apply, because you got to understand you have to be able to know how to draw on the eldership that has been placed before you. And as we began to pursue, these are the same ones, the scriptures say, by their fruit you shall know them. These are the same ones that helped us navigate the birth of our dear son when doctor said, no, you're going to have to have a C-section. The, the child is not doing well. The same ones that helped us navigate how to stand on the word of God and navigate this system. During this time, the Lord was revealing to us how to press in and we would go before them. Family, such that the Lord had asked us to begin to, as, we, uh, uh, as the Lord had been ministering to us, to look at what's in our hand and to let go of dead weight. All right? Let that minister to you. So much so, and during this testimony, we just want to give so much honor to the man and woman of God because they were instrumental in this past weekend, how they navigated us through knowing how to obtain what we have seen and we were able to walk away with a new car. Come on, come on somebody. I want somebody to be encouraged because look, you got to know what the instructions are for you. You got to know your instructions Take it before your daddy and say, look, okay, this is what you said, I'm going to do it. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Our strength has been renewed. Family, I want you to be encouraged this season because our light has come. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Can we borrow that? Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so very much. Let's celebrate those guys. Hallelujah, Adam, Alan, and Diamond. God is good and celebrate my sister Kanita as she comes up too. What a glorious, glorious day. Oh yeah, yeah. First of all, before you speak, can I just ask you, how do you feel? Don't ask me that. Okay, all righty. <laughs> That's the reason why I asked. I'll let you go. <laughs> Cause I ain't got no tissue up here. <laughs> I got a testimony, y'all. I was just telling the girls um, while we was eating that great thing is what's happening for me and Tyler. It's a lot of people gone. I was holding on to relationships for 10 years. People that I should have let go a long time ago. Um, 
high grades of cancer in my cervix, um, having surgeries. <laughs> I'm trying to hold it together because God is so good. And I don't know if y'all ever know that if you don't know if you're going to be able to make it to even raise your kids or be around for your family. My mom has always been there for me. My kids always been there for me, and they actually are the ones that inspired me to, to share my message today. I was just like what you said. I was taught to keep what happens in this house in this house. I wasn't willing to share my testimony. And after I went to the doctor on um, April 26th for them to do more biopsies, I went in not even worried. I wasn't even bothered by it because I knew I was going to come out all right. And it wasn't until we was on Help Us On Watch and Ann was just giving a great word that morning. And right after we got off, I checked my email. And it said, when I put it in the chat, and I was like, oh my God, they don't have no signs of cancer in, in my service no more. <laughs> Faithful. Praise the Lord. When you told us to come up for prayer, come on. for you to lay hands on us, praise God. I did that, even though the devil wanted me to sit in my chair and don't do nothing. Oh, come on. And I did it anyway. I pushed through. Praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. So I just want to let anybody know, whatever it is that you're going through, hmm. God is so faithful. Yeah. This is communion house season for us all. Woo! <laughs> praise the Lord. Come on. Hallelujah. All righty. God is good. Awesome, awesome. God is good. Come on. Let's give Jesus a big hand, everybody. Let us celebrate the Lord. Give him praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. King of glory, give him praise. Give him praise. Always give him praise. Hallelujah. I want you to look at yourself and tell yourself, Mine is on the way. Praise the Lord. God is good. God is good. Come on, let's be seated. Praise the Lord if you can. God is good. The faithfulness of God. I tell you what, the, without us planning it, we see the theme of both testimonies. Same. Our brother Alan said, whatever the Lord has said to you, do it. You do what he says, and then you get to see what he has done. Do what he says. You do what he asks you to do. And you heard what our sister Kanita said as well. She said, the Lord said to her to let them go. That was the first time as I was sitting there, just as you were, that I heard the full testimony. But before she came on, what did the Holy Spirit inspire me to say to y'all? That it is not everything that is in your body that is as a result of the processed food that we're eating. Some things are in our bodies just because of situations and circumstances. As she was speaking, this, is what, this one was one of the things that I heard. Do what the Lord says, not what your situation says. Because our situations and circumstances, they like to dictate things to us. They tell you to worry. They tell you to panic. They tell you to be bitter. No, the word of God wouldn't ask you to worry. The word of God doesn't tell you to. In fact, it tells you not to. The word of God tells you to not allow yourselves to be overwhelmed by situations and circumstances. But situations and circumstances, including people that they have overcome, they will suggest all kinds of things to you. So remind yourself, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I am free to do what my heavenly Father says. I will not be shackled by what my body is dictating and what situations might be suggesting. I will do that which the Lord has said. Mark chapter 3 verse 3 once again. And it says, and he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Thank God for the year 2023 at Communion House. It is our year of what? Going forth. We are going forward. Hallelujah. But just 
like that, that is the secret. The secret to going forward is what? To step forward. You know, many of us are expecting for the line to be changed because of us. The finish line is not going to be brought to you, not placed behind you. The finish line is where it is by God's design. If you're going to cross that line, you have to move in that direction. You understand what I mean? So don't be waiting until the prices of homes become $2 again before you buy. You see what I mean? If, it, if they set it to 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, and that is the one that the Lord has for you, what do you do? You cross that line, not in greed, not by being excessively consumed with materialism, but by recognizing what is yours as a tool for fulfilling your assignment. You understand what I mean? And so what do you do? You step forward to cross the line. Look at the story of this man who had the withered hand. In fact, let's read the first two verses just for the people that may not have read Matthew uh, since the summer of 92. Let's remind thee of what it says. Matthew chapter 3 verse 1, it says, And he entered the synagogue again. And a man was there who had a withered hand. The Bible was very clear that Jesus entered the synagogue again. When you hear someone's testimony, they're testifying of what Jesus has already done or what he did the last time he was at the synagogue. But he is back in the synagogue again. So what do you do? You step forward to receive what he has for you. And the Bible goes on to say here in verse 2, So they watched him closely whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they may accuse him. Look at what's going on in here. This is what the people of the world, this is what they do. They're waiting to accuse God for intervening on your behalf because they don't believe you deserve it and they don't even believe that God can. And so when things begin to happen in your life, people are like, uh, is he going to get out of this mess this time around? I don't think so. And what they're saying is, we don't think he deserves to get out. You understand what I mean? People will look for every legal reason to question your miracle, your blessing, and to even question the mercy of God upon your life. They are there concerned about the Sabbath when there is a man who cannot even work on Wednesday. You're talking about observing the Sabbath, saying, oh, no one should work on the Sabbath. But this one has no hand. Sabbath aside, he cannot even do any work. See, this is how people think. People, but not just people. Let's not make it about people today. But let's make it about the fact that in this life, there are situations, ideologies, notions that we have bought into that keeps us from receiving what God has already done for us. Many of us, God wants to bless us, but we don't believe that it is right for us to receive that blessing. Because these people were like, it's the Sabbath. No one should receive healing on the Sabbath. Let me give you a very good example. Still using the housing market as an example. Do you know that some people have already concluded that they cannot own a property in this market because it's a seller's market? And people are like, oh, I'm just going to wait until it's a buyer's market. Wow. Wow. So you think God is more powerful when it's a buyer's market? than he is when it is a seller's market? Let me tell you something. One of the things that we can do for ourselves that will be most beneficial is to constantly remind ourselves that we are not the creators, that we are God's creation. Because quite often, because we are made in his image and in his likeness, we like to play God. We like to think that certain things depend on us, whereas the reality of it is we are supposed to depend on him. You know, we tend to think of ourselves as being responsible for our own lives, whereas he says, you are my planting. The Bible says we are the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. We are God's investment. And so we should always be eager to see what else God wants to do with his investment and be in agreement with him as opposed to constantly challenging God's position in our lives. It might be the Sabbath all day long, but God has chosen to do something about the man with the withered hand. Verse 3, 
That was just a foundation for some of us, but now let's go to verse 3 again. And the Bible says, And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. I want to bring out a couple of things and share with us from this particular expression. The man with the withered hand was not asked to shake hands with Jesus. He was asked to step forward. God will not ask you to do what he hasn't empowered you to do. But there is no time in your life that he has not empowered you to do something. Many of us, the Lord is asking us to step forward, but we're saying, but you can see, Lord, that I do not have any hands. And the Lord is saying, the last I checked, I did not make you to walk on your hands. He may not have hands, but he had legs. You may not have money, but you have sense. Let me tell you something. Quite often, what we do is we are so obsessed with what we are missing that we lose sight of what we have. You may not yet have a breakthrough, but you have a praying spirit. Many of us, we keep waiting until we have what we think we need before we use what we already have. Let me tell you something, every single one of us, regardless of the situation that we find ourselves in, that which God has told you to do is exactly what you have been empowered to do. You want to go forward? You have to step forward. Jesus is not saying to him, do a handstand because he can see that he has no hands. But Jesus said, step forward. Now, what I found very interesting in the life of this man and in this particular account was that when God asked him to step forward, he asked him to use something that he has become very tested in. Most people who have no hands end up developing abilities in their legs. I'm sure you've seen people who can write with their toes. People that are born without hands, what do they do? They begin to use their legs to do other things. Even you, when you're carrying stuff and you want to open the door, what do you do? You use your legs to open the door. And the beauty of that situation is God knows that for you to advance in life, you would need to use your legs to step forward. And that is the reason why he allows for your hands to be suspended for a while so that you can exercise those legs. So in the day that you need to step forward, you have no excuse of not, because some people will say, well, how can I step forward when I don't have legs? And so God makes it happen such that you are deprived in certain areas so that you can fully utilize certain abilities that you otherwise may have only used somewhat. You know, we go through situations in our lives where we're saying, man, in the, I, I just struggle to hear God. But if you think about it thoroughly, those times that you have not been hearing God as clearly as you want to, you've been acting more confidently and more boldly because you've had to do things regardless. I tell you one of those things that happened to me a while ago in the world of business was I'm very happy creating solutions and writing things up and developing intellectual property. But then I went through a time wherein nobody was asking me to develop intellectual property like I like to. I like to build things that no one's built. I like to think out the box and create something that is unique. My goal when I'm setting out to develop intellectual property is to write something that is patent worthy, that is patent worthy. I want to write something because I know when God called me, he said to me, he was calling me to the unprecedented. And I carry that with me in everything that I do. 
But when there was this drought of an invitation to create the unprecedented, I started to get restless and discouraged, saying, God, what is going on? You gave me this ability. You are the one at work and me both the will and to do of your good pleasure. But you know what happened in the process was, I had no choice but to get myself understanding better how to operate in the field where there are already several players. You see, many times, or many a times, the enemy of our progress is the familiar. Many of us aren't willing to let go of that which is familiar. I like to call them familiar spirits. If you haven't heard me teach on familiar spirits, you can look it up on YouTube. I preached a message titled Resisting or Overcoming Familiar Spirits. The word spirit means air or wind. And so when you add familiar with wind, it talks to you about environments that you have become familiar with. Airs that you have become accustomed to breathing. Atmospheres that you are accustomed, that you have become accustomed to, to operating in and Every now and again, we need a change of environment. We need a change of perspective. But that which is familiar gets in the way like a huge stumbling block. One of the things that happened to me initially was I was being asked to write contracts and to create proposals for businesses that I know that everybody Almost everybody does, and you can just go and ask anybody, oh, why do you do this stuff? And they will tell you. And I'm like, man, this feels like a waste of who I am and what I like to do. But guess what? That was all I had. So you know what I did? I was like, okay, I'm going to see if I can at least do something different so that when somebody reads this, they will know that I wrote it, that I didn't download it from the internet. And in the process of doing that, I realized that God was helping me to actually see that for me to be able to move forward, I need to develop that which I had become weak in. I didn't realize how weak I had become in doing some things that are somewhat mundane. So when I realized that, I'm like, oh, okay, if this is what we're doing, let's do it. Let's get in there and and not blend in, but be in that common space, but find a way of bringing excellence out of that which is called generic. The man that we're dealing with here is a man who needed just one thing to move forward in life, and that is to use his legs. And his hands, being withered, has been seen or may have been seen by everybody as a disadvantage, but from God's perspective, it is a way of making sure that his legs are strong because he would need them. The Bible says that it is in my weakness that the strength of God is made perfect. You see, what I had become familiar with, what, I, what had been a source of prosperity for me, I'd suddenly become a thing that I felt like I owned and commanded. You could ask me to do certain things and I wouldn't even pray about it because I'm like, I got this. Because I had become comfortable in that space. But the Lord was like, okay, if you continue flourishing in that strength, you will completely lose these other abilities because you would not use them. Imagine if suddenly, Brother Bernard, you, you have wings and you can fly. Especially in Atlanta traffic, it's not going to be long before you lose the ability to use your legs. You will no longer call for your children to come from upstairs to get you the remote control. You will just fly to it. Anything that anybody is saying is like, don't worry, I got you. You will just fly there simply because you have received a new ability that seems very unique. And that celebration sometimes becomes an obsession. You begin by celebrating that which is unique and after a while you become obsessed with that is unique to the point wherein you lose that which might be essential on the day of promotion. This man was asked by the Lord to step forward. And verse 4 says, Then he said to them, this is Jesus speaking to them, 
Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? They kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched out his hand, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. As we continue in this season of breakthrough, I want us to understand the principles of God's miracle delivery. You see, because we think mostly of miracles from the standpoint of how we want to receive it. I'm always thinking about how I expect God to do this thing and do that thing and do this other thing, but what about how God himself has always done it, which never changes. My situations may change, my needs may change, my tastes may change, but the Bible says that God never changes. So it behooves me, or it is a great benefit to me to learn the way God delivers miracles. The first principle that I'm sharing with us today, I've already described it, let me just tell you what it is. It is the principle of understanding that God would not ask for you to begin your miracle with what he has not already given to you. The genesis of every miracle, the starting point of every miracle is that which you have already received. Now, the second thing about that which you have already received is God does not use things that have not been tested. And so he gets you to test and be confident and be vast or developed rather in that one thing that he needs to use. Let's take the example of Moses. Moses was very comfortable with the sword. He was raised in the palace of Pharaoh. He was a general in that army. In fact, history reveals that when he became a fugitive in Egypt and he went to another place, he went to the regions of Nineveh. And when he got to the regions of Nineveh, they lost their king and this stranger became their king and general. Why? Because he was a mighty warrior. But God did not need a sword, a spear, nor chariots to deliver his people. He required only a rod and Moses was not raised a shepherd. So God had to take away his sword. He had to take away his spear. When you read the details of what happened beyond what's just beyond the summary that we see in Genesis and Exodus of how he got to the house of Jethro and was immediately given a wife, it seems like he was immediately given a wife, but history tells us that it wasn't so. They first of all disarmed him, took everything away from him and put him in detention for a while because they said someone must be looking for this man. He looks like a warrior. If he's here by himself, he's done something. Someone must be looking for him. Let's make sure that we're not making enemies by harboring a fugitive and he was dispossessed for a while. Eventually, what do we see? We saw that the same person who was raised a warrior, who had lived a warrior, who had had to fight to save his own life, was now offered no job related to his resume. He was offered the job of a shepherd. Imagine if you had been skilled in all kinds of martial arts and, and swordmanship and, and all kinds of archery and you find yourself in a situation where everybody around you is just rearing a cattle and every day all they give to you is a stick and they tell you don't let them go and graze over there and once they're done, put them back in here. You can imagine how frustrated this man would be. Do you know quite often we don't even think about how frustrated Moses must have been because while he was there holding the stick, you know that he would remember the stories that were told of how every toddler was killed when he survived. And how that which should have been a blessing would become a huge frustration because Moses must have heard that when he was born, Pharaoh was killing every Hebrew child that was a male, but somehow he survived because they said that God told them to preserve his life. Because by that particular point in time, he was not impressed with God. I don't think I would have been. Because imagine that high, living, growing up knowing that the hand of God is on your life. Growing up hearing the stories of how God supernaturally and miraculously del delivered you. Growing up knowing that the house of Pharaoh prospered because you are in it. And suddenly, you are now nobody in the backside of the desert. 
You're like, okay, did they just make up all those stories? Or maybe God changed his mind, maybe he found a better Moses somewhere who was maybe more, more fluent, who can speak more freely. You know, you would think about all kinds of things. So Moses was not particularly a happy shepherd. He was there because he had no choice. That which he knew to do was taken away from him. Why? Because God needed to Keep away every distraction and create the urgency and the need to develop that which God needs to use. Ladies and gentlemen, your life is not your own. God made you for his purpose and he will be the one to determine what he develops because he knows exactly what he needs. Let's stop struggling with him and let him have his way. Because how did God deliver the children of Israel? The Bible says, by his outstretched arm and the rod of Moses. Every time they were faced with opposition, God did not say, bring out your sword. He never said, bring out your bow and arrow. He never said that to Moses. He said to Moses, stretch forth your rod. And so his own natural abilities and those things that he was familiar with had to be taken from him so that he had no choice but to lean on this staff and be so comfortable with the staff that when he saw the burning bush, he didn't take a bucket of water, he took a staff. Think about that for a moment. <laughs> Most of us, when we see a burning bush, we will get some water. But you took that which the bush is asking for, every fire needs a stick. That was counterintuitive, but because of his situation, because of his circumstances, he took that which he had. He had nothing but that stick. He was in the desert. If he wanted water, he would have had to go and draw it from the well, and it was nowhere near the well. Because back in the day, men are not allowed near the well. The well is for women. And that was why you read the account of Moses that when he got there, the women were being challenged by hooligans. And he was the only man that was available to rescue them because men were in the harder places. Women were in the softer sides of life. And so young man, if your wife is telling you that she wants to be on the softer side of life and be a stay-at-home mom, She's only asking for what has always been. It's called the ancient landmarks. You understand what I mean? It is by God's design that women can choose to be on the softer side of life. They can choose to be by the well. You go in the backside of the desert where there are stones, where there are wild animals. You, you do that. You understand what I mean? That is just for somebody who may encounter that later in life you know if your wife says well at this particular point in time I choose the softer side of life I'm just going to be at home you do what you have to do but this well must not run dry you understand me can I say that again this well must not run dry you understand me yeah as much as I want you in the back side of the desert making it happen I still want you to be attentive enough to show up in case there's a hooligan so a wife who is asking for that is not asking for too much. She's just asking what scripture already prescribes. Moses was a man with a withered hand. But when God asked him to step forward, God was asking him to use that which he had had no choice but to be developed in. The man with a withered hand had very developed legs because he's been opening doors with his legs. He's been pushing things out of the way with his legs because that was all that Jesus needed to perform that miracle. All of what God was asking of Moses was the rod. And so when God met with Moses, what did God ask him? Remember the question? God says, what is in your hand? And Moses was like, uh, a stick. Yeah, you've ever heard of one of those, Mr. Fireman? A uh, stick. You see, <laughs> what is interesting is, many times, <laughs> I thought about this and I, I, I let, me, let me see, let, let's find an illustration for what I'm about to share with you. I, I got a good one. You see, when the man who had the withered hand was asked by Jesus to step forward, do you know that 
many of us, what, would have, what we would have done, in essence, is we would try to call God's attention to what we think the problem really is. You understand what I mean? You know, initially be like, uh, instead of stepping forward, can't you just ask me to stretch forth my hand? God, are you sure you even know how to do your job? Can, are you sure you know how to be God? You understand what I mean? It's the hand that's the problem. My legs are fine, I can walk. Let, ask me to stretch forth my hand. But God who is asking you knows exactly what the problem is. When I was in my mid-twenties, I was completely taken over by the world of business. I traveled all the time and that became my excuse for not going to church. Because I'm like, what's the point of going to this church? They see me maybe once in six months and you go to that place, you can't even be planted and all of these and all of that. I had all the excuses in the world for not going to church. And so Sundays and Wednesdays, which were days that most people met, became my travel days. I traveled on those days because traffic was always light and most people were occupied with other things anyway so that I can always get there bright and early on Monday, ready to go. But when the Lord came to me and he told me that I had walked away from the call that he had upon my life and that I was getting myself further and further out, he said to me, it was time for me to serve again. And I thought to myself that, okay, if you want me to serve again, the first thing you should do is give me a business that does not require traveling. Because I'm like, the real problem is that I'm always traveling. You understand what I mean? Oh, you're asking me to step forward, but the real problem is that I, I don't have hands. If you want me to be planted in the local assembly and be serving, fix the business situation. Why is it that I'm the one who's always getting jobs that require traveling? That was what I thought it was. But guess what? I traveled even more after that time. But you know what God did? God just needed me to use my heart in obedience to do what he says. I made a commitment. Partnered with somebody who was planting a church in the local community. And I noticed that somehow God always made a way for me to be able to return on Wednesdays. You understand what I mean? It was on one of those Wednesdays that I was ministering that my wife decided that maybe she would give her life to Christ. You understand what I mean? You see, but I thought God needed to fix one thing, but what God was after was exactly what God wanted to use, and that was what I needed to be able to move forward. And you know what that is? It wasn't the lack of travel. It was just the attentiveness to his voice. The attentiveness to his voice was what he needed to use to move me forward. He was developing my ability to hear him and that is the reason why I was traveling all the time. You know when you travel all the time, it's difficult for you sometimes to hear because you're always introducing yourself to new people. You're always reading signs on the road. You're always at the airport listening to all of those things. There is so much commotion going on around you all the time. And if you can hear God in the middle of all of that, then when the time comes and it situates you in a tent, it will almost be as if God is always on a megaphone in your ears because you have learned to hear in the midst of chaos. My submission to you folks today and the reason why God asked you to come with that specific expectation is because some of us, God wants to reveal to us the obsession that we have with what we think the problem is as opposed to exactly what God needs to use. When Jesus came again into the synagogue, this man would have been there with an expectation to have his hands fixed which is not a bad idea. In fact, the Lord Jesus granted that desire. He fixed that hand, his hands grew, he had what he came for, but God also revealed that he needed more than just have hands that work. He needed to move forward. God wants you to be closer to him. When Jesus asked the men to step forward, it was an invitation to come closer. You see, you need to be closer to him before he gives to you that which you have been asking for because if he doesn't allow for you to achieve that which is of eternal value before giving you the material ask, you may take the material ask and run even farther away from God. 
The Holy Spirit set you up, didn't he? You came here with a specific expectation today. That thing that was your specific expectation is most likely what you think needs to be fixed. But the Lord is saying, I'll fix it, but I want to fix something else first of all. We need to close the gap. You need to step forward. And what, hallelujah, and what will bring you closer is that which you have had to depend on in the absence of these other things. Many of us have been praying more simply because of the things that we are missing. Many of us have learned to do, make do with little because the plenty that we were asking for has been withheld for a while. You know how bad you were with money before 2017? But then, since that time when it, when it seems as if the well ran dry, you've learned how to stretch a dollar like it is made out of rubber. And the reason why the Lord has allowed you to come that way is because he wants to draw you closer by the weakness that you have had to depend on. He will fix it the way that hand but he's asking you to come closer. He's asking you to step forward. He's asking you to move in the direction of his leading. What the Lord is doing in here today, folks, is this. The Lord is doing a work in our hearts. He's allowing for us to see that which we may have been blinded to. He's allowing for us to see what we have in our hands. If you were Moses, and you saw the burning bush, you probably would have asked God to set you free. Living as a fugitive, no matter how comfortable your friends try to make you, is still not the most comfortable place to be. But the Lord allowed for him to experience being a fugitive so that he can develop the right kind of compassion for those who have been held captive. You see, what you have gone through is there by divine orchestration to enable you to be able to engage the heart of God for finding the right measure of compassion for those who will be in that situation or who are in that situation that God is leading you to. Let me go over the third and the fourth principle so that if you're taking notes, you can see what they are. Principle number one is this. When God is coming to rescue you and to move you forward, he would only ask for what he has already given to you. And that which you were deprived of, you were deprived of so that you can develop in other areas. And principle number three of how God brings his deliverance is that God brings his deliverance to you by letting you see that there is more than meet the eye. Our miracles come by faith. And what is faith? We walk by faith and not by sight. You see, most of us, our sights already tell us what the problem is. But your faith needs to identify what the real problem is so that you can move forward. The real problem with the man and the real intervention was not what he was seeing, which was the lack of hands, but it was what God was seeing, which was the lack of proximity. God wanted him closer. And so God in his manifold wisdom is going to get your attention and bring you to where you can see him because of what you're missing. But when you get there, do not challenge God and do not debate with him. Just do what he says. Principle number four of how God brings us deliverance is this. You see, the same God who said, my strength is made perfect in your weakness, recognizes that to you, that which you have been deprived of has been a thing or may have been a thing of shame, may have been a real struggle. You may even have thought that that same thing has disqualified you from several opportunities and left you relegated to, relegated to the backside of the desert. But the reality of it is this, the wisdom of God is such that he uses that which you seem to have been deprived of to give you a uniqueness that makes you perfect for your assignment. 
He gives you the kind of uniqueness that makes you perfect for your assignment. It is the manifold wisdom of God. Take the example of Moses once again. Moses was a man who had to lead about three million people through the wilderness. But he was not a stranger to the wilderness because all those years that he was a fugitive, guess where he was hiding? In the same wilderness. Someone says, Brother Moses, how does that apply to my situation right now? All I need right now is just to have the confidence to know that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I came here today with that specific request in my heart, saying, Lord, I just, if I can be sure that this is what I'm supposed to do, I have all the energy to put into it. I have all the passion and the desire to put into it. Lord, I just need that clarity. So how does the story of Moses and where he has been, how does that have anything to do with anything? I put it to you today that the clarity that you need is a function of the place that you have been. Ask yourself this situation. Why in the first place did you think think that it is important for you to be confident that this is what you're supposed to do. Why? Why? There are so many people living their lives not caring whether they are fulfilling purpose or not as long as they have the pleasures of life. But for you to have identified that it is important to live beyond the pleasure is already a great blessing to have the hunger and the thirst for clarity. It is a privilege. Ask yourself, why did I even think it is important to know? If you can answer that question, then you know exactly what the next line of action is. What is the answer to the question? The answer to the question is that God is the one that is letting you know that you are more than pleasure seeking, that you are a game changer who brings glory to God. So God has already revealed to you something about yourself that you're not even aware of. And the moment you realize that, then guess what happens? You begin to recognize that if truly God has appointed you here to be a game changer, then that means he is with you always because you are his partner and the one that is alongside with God is the one that God is alongside of. Praise the Lord. I'm going to read to us one more verse of scripture which is Matthew chapter 7 verse 14 and then we're going to break bread. Matthew chapter 7 verse 14. The Bible says because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. Therefore, a few find it. What I want us to bring out of that today is this. No matter how narrow and how difficult it is, God still allows for your life to move forward. Sometimes the fact that it's narrow is the reason why you cannot even turn your back on God if you want to. Because there is no wiggle room to turn. You see, we don't understand that the way God operates is that he has already understood everything. He made everything. And so you're saying, Lord, why is this so difficult? Why don't I even have a little wiggle room? Do you know how many times I have prayed to God and begged God? I said, God, just give me a break. Just give me a little wiggle room. And God is like, no, because if I gave you a wiggle room, you will not go forward. You will turn around and run. Man, the leader, the Lord is saying, step forward. Because you have no choice. The road is narrow. There's no room to turn and go back. God is doing you a favor by allowing things to be as tight as they are because he doesn't want your little behind to get scared and go back. Narrow and difficult. Yes, God says, I know it's narrow. And I know it's difficult because of the fact that I want you to have no choice but to keep your focus on me and to keep moving forward. And in case you're still wondering if truly this is how God operates, come with me to Psalms 51 and we're going we're gonna to break bread on this one. Actually, we're breaking bread from Jeremiah, but we're going to stop at Psalms. So just think about it as making a stop at a very beautiful island on your way to where you think you should be going. Oh yes, praise the Lord. Psalms 51, 
And I pray that this will set you free as it has been intended by God to free you from the burden of being in control of your own lives. Look at what David says here in verse 8 of Psalms 51. In fact, let's first of all read verse 4. Verse 4 says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Three things that I need to say to us very quickly, in fact, which were some of the first three things that the Lord said to me about this meeting, is that you cannot continue to feel guilty for your withered hand. Remember the man who was brought to Jesus blind. People were like, yeah, we can see. His parents are probably horrible people. Jesus says, no, don't say that. Jesus said this man was born blind not because of the sin of his mother, nor the sin of his father. But he was born blind that the father may be glorified. Whatever you're going through is all for his glory. God has allowed for you to be in that difficult situation because he knows what stuff you are made of. You're made of the stuff that reflects glory and he wants to show himself faithful on your behalf. And so no matter what it is that resulted in the withered hand, we did not know it was not recorded because it is immaterial. The man is not supposed to be responsible for his own withered hand. And you know Jesus didn't say, wow, you want healing? Who knows what you did with that hand in the first place? The pe people judge and think like that, but God is always eager. The Bible says if you know what it means that God desires to show mercy then pass judgment, you will not continue to condemn or castigate the guiltless. God is eager to show himself faithful. God is not blaming you for the decisions that you have made that put you in a situation of lack. He's just asking you to engage him and step forward so that he can have an opportunity to show through you that he is still Jaira, the provider. You see, when God gives you an opportunity to go through such challenges and difficulties, he doesn't want them to drown you. He wants it to be an opportunity for you to partner with him so that he can show himself as the deliverer. As long as you don't stay there, as long as you keep stepping forward, what did God say to Kanida? God asked Kanida to step forward. Step away from holding those people in your heart. Leave that place. Come here. Don't stay there and be feeling guilty for how the relationships ended up getting soured. Oh, maybe if I hadn't said this, or maybe if I didn't let them cross my boundaries, or maybe this and maybe that. God is like, forget about the maybes. It has happened. It is a mess, but we can turn it into a huge testimony and give you a message for the generations around you and the ones to come. The Lord here was teaching David that everything that David has gone through was an opportunity for the Lord to come through. You know, David was a man who was getting too confident in his own strength. What was David's strength? He was a mighty warrior. The guy was just a skilled warrior. I mean, he could take anybody out and take them down. And he became so confident in his ability to fight wars that he not only was able to fight wars, he had raised an army that could do battle even if David wasn't there. And the Bible says at a time when kings went to war, David did not feel the need to go to war. He stood at home and that was when he noticed another man's wife. Unbeknownst to him, God was setting him up for a promotion. God did not want him to stay in complacency. Because everybody went to war and he didn't feel like he needed to go to war. His army, they got it covered. And guess what? They did because they came back victorious, right? But guess what? When he was there, the Lord revealed to him that which really needed to be fixed. And you know what needed to be fixed? He felt at that particular point in time that everything that God had given to him was now his own. As a king, everybody is mine. You know, I can take whatever I want. And that was where his mind was, whereas the reality of it is that whatever God gives to you is still God's. You are only a custodian of it. And so when he fell, this was what he realized. He was like, wait a minute. This was you? So that you can be found blameless when you judge and just when you speak? 
That's what he said in verse 4. He says, against you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. So when you tell me it is time for me to do this, I cannot debate with you because you've already revealed my weakness. Many of us, when God is asking us to pray and everything is nice and dandy, you'll be like, God, is that really you? Because I feel so good right now, I want to play, not pray. But when God allows for situations to reveal your weakness and he says, Kanina, let us pray. You'll be like, ah, shaku, boom, ka. Simply because you know now that God is right. Asking you to pray. David says that you may be found blameless when you judge and just when you speak because I have seen that everything you were telling me to do, I needed to have done. You asked me to bring my heart so you can examine it, but I thought that I was on top of the world. Now I should have brought it. So you would have seen the wicked ways in me. And look at verse 8, which is where we're really going. He says, make me to hear or make me hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Who broke your bones? You thought it was that employer that broke your bones? You thought it was that ex that broke your bones? You thought it was your failure that broke your bones? You thought it was your own inabilities that broke your bones. Well, sorry to disappoint you. You're not that important in your own life. God broke your bones. David says, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. I want to encourage you today, forgive yourself, let go of all the grudge that you are holding against yourself because you blame yourself too much. You see, what happens to us is we blame ourselves so much that when Jesus says step forward, you're like, no, nah, I'm not qualified for whatever you want to do. When the Lord is saying step forward, like, you, like Isaiah was asked to step forward and he was like, me, step forward, look at me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm undone. I'm, I shouldn't even be here. Because of the fact that he could see, yes, he needed help, he needed a cleansing, but the reality of it is that many of us, our initial reaction when the Lord reaches out to us is like Jeremiah, he says, God, you must have the wrong guy. I'm a youth, Gideon, oh, you must have the wrong guy, I'm just a farmer. Moses, oh, you have the wrong guy, I cannot even speak. Everybody always thinks of what they do not have because they have become so obsessed with their own weaknesses and, so, and limitations. But the Lord who is asking you to step forward is asking you to step forward because he already gave you what, he, what you need to engage him. He's the one who's been breaking your bones because he's looking for a sacrifice. The Bible says that the, broken, the, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. The reason why he allows for you to go through the brokenness is so that you can be hopelessly dependent on him. And when I say hopelessly, is what Paul says by hoping against hope, that you do not have any hope of what you could do, but you have every hope of what he can do. There is deliverance in Zion today. There is, praise the Lord. There is deliverance in Zion today. And so we're going to break bread from the book of Jeremiah today. And so if you would turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 7 real quick. And we're just going to take this and use it to ingest the body and the blood of Jesus into us today. And I'm going to tell you principle number 5 and we're going to close out. So Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 7, what does it say? It says the lion has come up from his thicket, from the bush, and the destroyer of the nations is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. Without what? Inhabitant. Um, I've been picking up on this for a couple of weeks intensely in the last couple of days and you heard what I said I believe it was on Saturday talking to you about what is coming that there is a calamity that's been packaged by the dragon to be delivered by the beast and very soon we're going to understand a bit more clearly what that means um, I haven't said much about it I haven't dwelt on it because um, I haven't had the release to but then God gave Alan a dream and he shared with me, when he shared with me the dream, 
I knew what I must do. In the dream, the Lord revealed to him a horde, a arm, an army of sort, looking very fierce, trying to penetrate a curtain of water. There is a wall, like a barrier that is made of water and they're waiting behind and the Lord said to him, they have been delayed because of you. And the moment he said that, I already knew what that was. You know the barrier that is above us, the firmament. If you're coming from outside the firmament, what do you see? Water. The Bible says the waters above the firmament was called heaven, right? And where is the war going on at the moment? The war is going on in heaven. The Bible says and there was war in the heavens. So we know that these recruits that are coming into the world to cause chaos are waiting to penetrate our realm. A lot of things are dragging out in the world today. A lot of things are happening that just seem to make no sense. They are called fillers. It's, we are, the time is being padded because God in his mercy is giving us so much more time to repent, to get our acts together, you know, to, 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 to do more because we will be rewarded for the good works. But I come here to you today because even though I know they have been delayed, they are already close enough to touch the water. And so when they come, I'm going to continue a prayer from, that I started on Saturday, which is, no evil shall befall you. I want to say this to you just to reassure you, because the Lord reminded me of it during worship. You don't need to run. There is divine protection for you where you're at. You only need to move or make any move because God says it. Do not make any move out of fear. Begin to prepare yourself now. You have a couple of weeks, maybe a few months, but begin to prepare yourself now and keep saying to yourself, I will not move. I will not make a move out of fear. I will not respond out of anxiety, but I will only move by the, by the word of the Lord. I'm only going to move at the word of the Lord. Begin to instruct your heart right now to pay attention to the words of the Holy Spirit and to the word of God alone. Please, I beg you. Because when this thing started, one of the things that the Lord said to share with you is that you are a watchman and you have already seen the donkeys and the chariots. But don't stop at just what you have observed. Listen closely for what you need to hear. How many people remember? Now it's time for us to listen closely for what we need to hear because like I told you about a week ago that in the next couple of weeks, the new recruits of the false prophets with their lying wonders and their deception will come up in the news and say things to scare you, things to make you do what everybody else is doing. When that time comes, you will do what you have heard in the secret place. So listen very closely, folks, to what the Holy Spirit might be saying to you. Some of you have to speed up. Uh, you, you be ready to be sped up in the direction of being hitched. When these things happen, God does not want you to be alone in the physical. So there are certain people that have to be with you. Some of us, we need to be hitched and be connected to those who will be locked in with us. And so that process is going to speed up. So be ready to be sped up. Don't question God. Don't challenge him. Don't say, God, you're asking me to step forward, but I don't have hands. No, the Lord has already given you what you need to step forward. He's giving you a foundation, legs to stand on. I'm going to read one part of this um, Jeremiah um, 4 verse 7 again. And... In fact, I'm going to read everything, but I'm going to stress a little part of it, and that's the part that we're going to use in Breaking Bread. The Bible says, The lion has come up from his thicket. The destroyer of the nations is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. The cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. The cities will be laid waste without inhabitants. There might not be inhabitants in the city, but the inheritors will remain. You see, I had to, you see, the Lord had to make that clear to me. You know, because sometimes I'm like, okay, but we're going to inherit the land. So, but there will be no inhabitants. We're not just inhabitants, we are possessors. So there is a judgment coming. 
but is a two-edged sword. Remember what the Lord said to us about a year ago, which he confirmed through a dream that also Alan and maybe one more person had, that the same flood that will drown the enemy is what's going to lift us up. Jesus told us that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. In the days of Noah, the same flood that destroyed the giants and their offsprings and all the corrupt animals was the same flood that lifted the ark of Noah. So what do you need to do? The Lord said to me, tell them to set sail. The Lord showed me a ship that was on the water but above the water and I wondered how come it's able to do what it's doing even though it's not touching the water. And the Lord said to me, look at the way its sail is set. The sail was set to relax and so it was able to receive and hold a lot of wind and that was how it became buoyant. The Lord says, tell your siblings to be filled with my spirit. You need to be filled with the wind of the Lord. You need to set your sail so that when this bad news starts coming out in the news, like someone is reading a pre-recorded script, which it really is, what do you do? You do not allow your heart for a second to be broken. Your joy will be the natural response. So when people are getting anxious, you become joyful. When people are getting anxious, you become joyful. All right? So I say all of these things because of the fact that we... I told, I mean, I, when 2020 hit, I thanked God for how well we were prepared at communion house. But then I still got angry a little bit because of how unprepared or how ill-prepared several people were when 2020 hit. And one of the things that I said to myself, I was like, never again. This will not happen. We should be prepared. And so how do we get prepared? We get prepared not just by learning principles of how to be a good Christian and how to be nice to other people. We need to prepare by having our spirits given the instructions of life that would enable for us to always have on the whole armor of God. What I am doing here by the Lord today is I am helping you put on the whole armor of God it may feel uncomfortable. It may feel like, oh, what is this about? It may feel like a drill. But the reality of it is you will thank the Lord later. Simply because you see certain things, okay, the time is far spent, but we're going to break bread. And the part of it that we're going to dwell on for breaking bread is this. The Bible says in verse 8, for this, clothe yourself with sackcloth, lament and wail. For the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. You see, I was being mindful of time, but I was cautioned to go into that. The part that you have to play is very simple. Consecrate yourself. When the Lord talks about sackcloth, Weeping and lamentation is talking about consecration, right? Consecrate yourself. I'm going to share this vision with you very quickly. The vision that this vision started with me seeing people greeting their neighbors. It looked like an old Mediterranean village made completely out of stones. Even the, 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 the walkways between the houses were made out of stone. And they came out in garments, everybody dressed the same, saluting their neighbors. And suddenly I noticed a sprinkle of some powdery substance. It was like pink in color. It was being sprinkled upon everybody. And guess what I was told? I was told that they were meant to have gone inside. So there are some people who have remained on the streets who are still carrying on with life business as usual who are supposed to have heard the call of God to withdraw to their chambers in Goshen. So I say to you today, folks, the Lord is giving us an opportunity to dust off the powder because that is only a test. Because what is coming after that is not going to be powder. What is coming after that is going to be the actual spirit of destruction. So what do you need to do? Dust yourself from every excessive engagement with the world and withdraw into your chambers. Take off that garment so that you're not tempted to go out. 
put on the sackcloth because once you have the sackcloth, you don't want anybody to see you in places that you don't need to be. What am I saying is in essence? What I'm saying in essence is this. Spend more time drawing closer to God because there is not that much out there for you as there was. Let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. So in, in conclusion, as we break bread, let's go back to that seven. Seven says the lion has come from his thicket and the destroyer of the nations is on his way. The lion that is being described here is, this, is the devil. The Bible says the devil goes around like a what? A roaring lion seeking whom that he might destroy. The nations might be destroyed, but you will not be destroyed. Because you have already come out from among them and you have been made separate. And so as we break bread today and we receive the blood of Jesus, let us be full of gratitude to God in our hearts for the blood of the Lamb that is also the blood of the Passover. That because Jesus already shed his blood for me, whatever is coming will pass me over. And as we eat of the Lord's bread today, I want you to be remembered that your bones may be broken in the process of getting you to be strong, but Jesus' bones were not broken so that you can be restored to his image. And so as you receive the body of Jesus today, say, Father, I thank you for the bones that you have broken in the process of making me humble, the process of making me strong, the process of getting my attention, the process of getting me to, to, to notice that I have strength in weakness, the bones that you have broken. Father, I thank you for those. But I also know that when you mend me, I will be like Jesus whose bones were never broken. There will not be a trace, but there will be every grace. There will not be a trace, but there will be every strength that I have received left intact even after I have been restored. So Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the body of Jesus and his blood that was shed for me. You may eat and drink. All in, all in remembrance of him. Praise the Lord. We're just going to say one more prayer real quick. And I want you to be very intentional. I want you to be very intentional. You see that expectation that you came with. For some of us, they are things that have been like a stronghold for a while. So I'm going to pray for you later, but, first, but I want to first of all pray for the people who have come with that one expectation which is not a stronghold, but which is a desire. It's just something that you would like to have. So if your one expectation today is a desire to have something or to possess something that you believe will be an increase or bring increase into your life, I want to pray for you first, so just stand up wherever you might be. So remember, I said today, come with an expectation. Have an expectation of something specific that you want the Lord to do for you. So if your expectation is more of an addition of something that, you'd, that you've not had, that you desire, stand up first. So I will pray after for the people whose one thing is actually something that has been a stronghold that they're saying, Lord, we need this to be removed. Okay, so there's a difference. Okay, so the people standing here now are the ones who have come to receive. So I declare over you in the mighty name of Jesus this very moment, an open heaven. In the mighty name of Jesus, let your heaven be opened that you may receive that which you have brought before the Lord. The Lord has asked you to step forward by asking you to come here with an expectation. You have come and again the Lord came to the synagogue today. And now hear the voice of the Lord. Stretch forth your hand and receive. 
the man did not ask for anything to be taken from him. He was in need of something to be added to him. And so that which you have been asking to be added, that hand, receive that hand. Because a hand is indicative of abilities that one may once be missing, but that one is in need of. So today you are receiving your hands. You already know how much that is going to help you to carry weight. That which you have put before the Lord, that which you have brought before him today as an expectation, is going to help you to do what? Is going to help you carry weight. It will enable you because it constitutes hands and the ability to lift, the ability to move things around. So receive your hands today. Hands are being given out today in terms of ability to do the impossible. In terms of the ability to be able to carry out functions in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, I want you to be seated. For those of us, okay, somebody needs to continue praying. And I said, Lord, why is that so? And the Lord says, because in the place of prayer, it will reveal to her that which she must repent of. Can I take a moment to tell you something the Holy Spirit told me recently? He said to me, there is a difference between resisting and repenting. Some of us have not repented, but we're just resisting ourselves from doing that which we typically do. So let's say that you have not repented from drinking excessive alcohol. Your, your heart hasn't repented, but because of certain constraints, maybe a spouse, a friend, a child, or your job, you are resisting from taking it. God sees your heart. He knows that in your heart, your position is still, all things being equal, I'm going to knock myself out. But you're resisting because you've given yourself reasons to resist. The Lord is saying, some of us have confused resisting for repenting. And he wants to bring us to the place of repenting, wherein we actually find the wisdom of God that exposes what we're doing for what it is, that we may be willing to repent of it. So your prayer will continue because you need more repenting. Because God has already given you the hints. He's done what he, what he says he will do. But even you might not be able to use it until you have aligned yourself in the process of repentance. You see why you're yet to be repentant? Though the hands are there, your nerves are not connecting. So it's still kind of like a dummy hand. And so that's why you need to continue praying and you already know who you are, praise the Lord. Now, for you who came here today saying that there is a stronghold, in fact, there are two of those things. For you in particular, there are two things. When you came in here today, you couldn't separate one from the other. And so you brought those two things before the Lord and he says, Lord, these things have to be done away with. They have to be dealt with. They have to be removed because they have been strongholds. I want you to rise. Father, thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Stretch forth your hands toward the two of them, please. Oh, everybody that is standing, stretch forth your hands toward them. And in agreement today, the Bible says, whatsoever two or three of you shall agree concerning on earth, it shall be done in heaven. We stand with you in agreement today to say that every stronghold that has plagued your journey, every stronghold that has been in the way of progress, every stronghold that has constituted a ridicule in your life. Every stronghold that has become a thing of shame, that has become a thing that robs you of liberty. Particularly the ones that are the two pillars. There is this stronghold that is so connected, the two of them, that you have brought before the Lord today. It has been leveled to the ground in the mighty name of Jesus. We're still in the season of preparing for Pentecost. And that is the reason why we have been reminded to forgive, reminded to let go, reminded to be at peace with all men because the Bible says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. And these strongholds are also in the way of your preparation for Pentecost and that is why the Lord is leveling them to the ground today. The Egyptian you see today, you will see them no more. Be seated in glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. I thank God for this meeting because um, you know, I already knew that there will be deliverance in this place today. The Lord said to me to encourage you to make a note of today. Make a note of days like this in general, 
specifically make a note of this moment. And if you haven't made a note of last week, make a note of last week. You know, I told you that last week was a week of breakthrough. And some people are like, oh, but I haven't seen my breakthrough. When you see your breakthrough, I guarantee you, you will see the connection to last week. Some things have already been done last week for you that you haven't seen. God is not a man that he should lie, not the son of man that he should repent. As he said it, will he not do it? So don't let the devil rob you and drive you out of your place before your miracle comes. God has already done it. You see what I mean? I was about telling my wife, saying, oh, man, I'm thankful for Alan. I'm thankful for Kanita because that last week, they received breakthroughs. And I was about to say to my wife, that man, I, I wish I had something tangible like that to say. And while I was about to say it, the Holy Spirit reminded me of something that happened in our business that I didn't even think was something serious. But then the Lord said to me, if you had not found those people, they could have made away with what is yours. And they've been doing it and they took their time to plan it. And the Lord exposed them. But because it was the Lord who did it, it seemed like I was just fortunate. I am blessed. And so I want to encourage you, if God says it, you should expect nothing less. Even for those of you that weren't here, God's done something that week for all of us. And when yours begins to manifest, even you would testify as well. Praise the Lord. All righty. I'm going to hand over to Alan just now. But as he's walking up here, I saw Matthew 7, 14 again. And since we have already stayed this long, we might as well just go to that Matthew 7, 14. And the Lord says to me, to say to you, it is with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Do yourself a favor in this moment. The Bible says that what? That only a few find it. I want you to say, I will find it. I will find the wisdom for this season. I will find direction. And I will find peace. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lastly, I'm going to leave you with this one. I'm glad that I didn't forget. Last week, or about three minutes ago, the Lord said, we're coming into a season of aggressive witnessing. Which means... We're not, it's not like we're going to be banging people's doors, but it means that we're going to be effective at ministry. And the Lord says to me to ask you, are you ready to disciple? If you're ready to disciple, God will bring them. Okay, if you're ready, he will bring them. God bless you. Alan. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's celebrate. I'm not going to hold this. We see the given details on the screen. To our family online, if you'd like to give, uh, at Communion House, at Cash App, at Communion House, at PayPal. We also have the Zelle information there. To our family here, if you need an envelope, it's there to my left, your right. We will uh, wait a couple of seconds and go ahead and lift up this offering. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. Lord, we thank you for this evening of deliverance, of encountering you, being in the company of innumerable angels, O oh God, revealing yourself to us more and more each meeting, O oh God, as we forsake not the assembly or the gathering together of ourselves as your word has instructed us, O oh God, you honor us. Father, let these offerings unto you, these uh, givings of faith, let them be sweet smelling. Let them be found pleasing in your sight, O oh God. We thank you for how you have met with each and every one of us, O oh God, how you've done such a tactful work, such a deep work in us, O oh God, that we may carry this home. And even, Lord, as the man of God has declared over us, has asked us, Lord, if we are ready to disciple, O oh God, we receive. And, Lord, we thank you by your Holy Spirit that you will bring to our remembrance even those that you have brought in our immediate circle, that circle of influence, O oh God, that we may not have perceived the first or second time, O oh God, that we may be effective, for the grace is upon us. Lord, we declare that all glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen. amen.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Y'all have a blessed night and we'll see you Saturday.